Welcome along to the third and final session of Event Tech Talks, our first ever Event Tech Talks. Um, and before we crack on with this last particular session, let's just uh, give a few thank yous and a few uh, name checks to some of the people that have helped us out in staging this afternoon's Event Tech Talks. Um, our headline sponsor, GES, um, and our event partners, Boomset, Event Industry News, Glissa, N200 GES, First Sight Media and KPMG. Thanks to all of the guys, thanks to Richard and the crew who are doing the live stream for us today. Um, we're in Huckletree, a fabulous, a brilliant tech venue and a perfect setting for this afternoon's Event Tech Talks. Um, for the audience and those people who are watching on the live stream, um, please continue to interact using Glissa this afternoon. We're using Glissa to put questions on the screen behind me, um, and there should also be a link to it on the live stream, uh, glsr.it forward slash tech talk is the URL to visit to engage with Glissa. Let's move on with our final session of the afternoon. Um, and we're gonna be looking at technology. Is it an enhancement or is it a distraction? We've already touched on that briefly in both of the previous sessions this afternoon. Let's talk about it in a bit more detail and let's have a rant. Let's have a good old ding dong about whether it's an enhancement or a distraction. Let's welcome, first of all, our panel. Richard Hingley from DRP Group, thanks for joining us. Hi, James. Katie Williams from Guidebook. Katie, welcome along. Hello, thank you. Richard Cayley is from Eventbase. Richard, good Hello. to see you. And Mark Bannister from George P. Johnson, welcome along, Mark. Hi. Um, People are, I guess, familiar with some of your organisations. Let's very, very briefly look at what each of your individual organisations do so that we can put into context your thoughts on enhancement or distraction when it comes to event tech. Richard, let's start with you and DRP Group. So, yes, I'm DRP. We're a creative comms agency, so we cover events, digital and video communications as well. Uh, but it's all about creative comms and very much about experience and engagement. And Katie, Guidebook. Guidebook is a platform for building event apps and for uh, apps for places as well. Excellent. Richard? Eventbase focuses on event apps for premium events, so high-end production of event apps. And Mark, George P. Johnson? Uh, we're an experiential agency, end-to-end um, -end organizing of big shows, small shows, trade shows, stands. Um, when it comes to technology being an enhancement or a distraction, I, I'm willing to bet that everybody sat here today and everybody watching the live stream has an opinion on this. They will have ex seen examples of both, and we've touched on examples of both distraction and enhancement already today. Where do we think we are at the moment with technology? Is the tail wagging the dog, or are organisers driving and using it as an enhancement? Um, I'll start, Jane. I, I, I think it's a bit of both, really. I, I think it sits somewhere in between um, both areas. I think it's, it is a distraction, and sometimes a very welcome one. Um, but it's also great for execution and great engagement as well. Um, so I think it's a bit of a challenge of, of who's actually driving it. It's ultimately driven by the consumer, the user, the delegate, um, the visitor, um, who want a requirement to use it. They don't always know why, but I think it's expectation if there isn't one then where is it, uh, and I want to do this with it. So um, I, I, I think it works both ways. I think from a, from a client perspective, we get asked for it all the time. Uh, we must have one. I think the question, as we've heard today in, in both sessions so far, is why. Uh, and it always starts with the why, because if you don't get that right, then there's no rationale to why you've got it when you're there, and you don't really enhance and get the best out of your event from, from having one. Um, so I agree with the first part of what you said in that it can be either or, but there's something that you said that I actually disagree with. I don't think that it necessarily is driven by the user, or in this case by, by the delegate, whether or not it's an enhancement uh, or a distraction. I think that actually comes from the organizer, the person actually producing the technology and how it's positioned along with the overall strategy of the event or whatever it is that, that you're using uh, or, or promoting the application for. I think that's actually where we see more of the, uh, the, the downfall of the technology that ultimately does become more of a distraction than an enhancement is that the organizers are putting it forth as, or I guess they're not even really putting it forth, they're sort of adding it on as, a, as an afterthought um, or a sort of a, a nice to have as, as opposed to making it a core feature of, of the event. 
I think one of the reasons for that, I would say, is, is, is uh, I understand it's driven by, um, sort of by clients and the organiser, but that's also been driven by them, I think, from users wanting it as well. People are coming to the event or expecting it, so they're driven by a, a desire to, we must have one. If we don't, then people aren't going to be happy. They're going to ask, where is it, and this is what I want to do. So I think it's driven by both, but certainly the, the, the user is something that's in the forefront of an event organiser's mind. Mm. But Sorry to jump in there. Mm. I think... The, the binary requirement for having an app or not, like you said, it's user-driven, but then what you put into the app and what it actually does at the event is often organizer or sponsor-driven. And I think that's where some of the problems start because it, we've worked with all sorts of different organizations and some of them just go all over the, you know, all over the place and they just, you know, they've got this huge menu of options and they just say that, 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 and you end up with this thing that nobody knows how to use and it doesn't really do anything properly, and then you, you know, you failed basically with your event app. So I think the question is really, how do you, how can you manage the functionality that's really specific to a particular event um, that works for the people that are there? And I think, you know, that's where at the moment we're learning, and organisers are learning, and we've come, you know, a, a ways from the last two years where we really had people saying we want everything, and some of our competitors actually, you know, they offer this like guidebook or um, Double Dutch offer this big platform that has everything and people just, you know, out of instinct say, oh yeah, we'll, ha we'll have all that. Um, and, and I think now we're kind of moving a little bit away from that and trying to find specific use cases that work for specific kinds of event and then also looking at how we apply learnings from one event to the next in a particular series to, to really hone in on what the, va what the really valuable bits are. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's where we're currently at. Mm. I think engagement works both ways. So if you've got an app, then as an organizer, you have to be engaged in the content of that, which I think is what you're saying, that, that you have to actually make it relevant. You have to put some thought into it, some planning. And then the delegates at the other end are going to take more out and be more engaged in it. If you take social media, your delegates might be tweeting and engaging on social media, but that means nothing if you as the organizer or, or, or your client isn't engaging back. How careful or gung-ho was your own organization when the technology for the event industry really started to boom? Did you think, yeah, great, let's just start using it and see what happens? Or were you at the other end of the spectrum where you were perhaps a little bit tentative to, to actually look at how this could affect the clients and the level of clients that you guys are dealing with? Mm. Um, well, we have a registration team in-house, so I've always been, that side of it has always been a part of our business and, and what we've done from printing badges through to the, the kind of newer um, delegate management and that communication piece that happens pre-event. So we're already kind of set up for a lot of that. Um, I think when it comes to social media and, and the what you're gaining from that and, and interpreting and able to take from it, again, we were quite key. Our, the way we approach events are always about defining what it is you want, what it is you're trying to create, what it is the client needs, what it is the delegate needs. So, you know, the more sources of that kind of information you have, the better. I've noticed, I've just gone onto Facebook quickly, and Huckle Tree does pop up, but there are only 189 check-ins. Who promotes check-ins on something like Facebook at their events? Who promotes guests to actually just do something as simple as flipping the phone out of the pocket and checking in that they're at a particular event? We do it, but it's beacon-driven and it's based on your micro-location, so you get a pop-up if you're in a room for 10 minutes. Do you want to see who else is in the room? And that's how we get people to go in the radar. It's not a Facebook check-in, it's an in-app, mm -hmm. in-room, in-session check-in. The, re the reason I ask that is quite simple, is, is, is looking at this idea that have we got carried away too quickly with how advanced we can get with our technology and our events, and perhaps not just realised what the simple day-to-day -day practicalities are of, of every one of our audience members or delegates or guests having a smartphone in their pocket that can do quite simple things but do them very, very well. Do we need to take a step back at all? We I remember when we used to talk about events, it was always get people together because you want to see the whites of their eyes. That was a big thing, and now it's I want to see the whites of their screens. Because th things have changed very much. We, when, we, when we see people, when we see people at events, very much they can do so much. It's, it's very convenient. It's there. We all do it all the time. Um, we want answers very quickly. So I think there's certainly a, a benefit to be able to do that. Um, build an app or technology that enables people to do things the way they want to do it, when they want to do it. Because they'll find a way. We always do. So if we don't enable, enable that to happen, someone mentioned before about having Wi-Fi available. Absolutely, it needs to be, because people will find a way of doing it. If they can't do it in the room, they're going to get a signal outside the room. 
So you, we, we have to provide that sort of technology. Uh, and I think, I think the elements you're talking about are important to have. Uh, I'm curious, sorry to, to, to dive in, I'm just looking at the glissa feed as, as well that's coming in, and the question I'm, I think should be on the screen as well behind me, um, on the feed, why do we seem to be solely defining event tech as an event app? There's a world of amazing tools that aren't app based. We do seem to gravitate, don't we, back to event apps, and it, it, should we be looking at wider technology and what that can do for us as well? Perhaps I think we should the, start with the technology, sorry. Well, perhaps it's the terminology that we're using, mm. event tech. Maybe engagement tech is a better, better way of describing what it is we're looking to bring into the events, bring into the shows. And it's all things that help prolong the life of the event. So you're starting from months out when the first kind of details of the show are going out. There are apps, there are, um, there are online uh, methods of, of getting information to and from the delegates that can then inform the planning of the event on the day and then that builds up to on the day how you make the most of the content that's being delivered and then post event how that's followed up how that's continued on and, and how that the life of that one moment in time kind of extends both ways I think there's probably a couple of reasons why the conversation is gravitating that way first of all just because Richard and I obviously work for uh, absolutely app -based yeah. companies but yeah, also understandable. I think the nature of events themselves are where people are not, they're not stationary, they're, they're mobile, um, they're, they're in a different place and the technology that they have to hand is their smartphone. So I think event apps tend to be, even in a different, slightly different panel, would probably still be kind of what comes front of mind uh, when people think about event tech. I think also tech, they're the things we have least control of when it comes to the delegate because any other technology put in, normally it's in a certain way for a certain requirement, for a certain um, outcome, and we've got delegates controlled in an area when it comes to an event app or mobile technology, that's something we can't tie people's hands together and stop them from using it, we can't take their phones off when they walk in the room, so it's the things actually that can become a distraction because it's the least, or one of the biggest things we can't control when it comes to delegates. Um, mm, Please, Richard. The yeah. other advantage is also that you actually know what, you know, the user, um, if you've got other technology that you can use for engagement, like a Twitter wall or some overlay or you know a virtual reality experience um, it's it's hard to personalize that and um, what we're trying to do is when we're moving away from a distraction and using it as a useful tool it's often based on the user's preferences explicit or implicit so with the phone you've got the user right there you, you know you know what they're like because they've selected a set of events that they're going to see or you know that they were in a certain room for a, or they talked to a certain person you know based on all that data um, you can you can become more relevant, and that's how you uh, we feel at least that's you know how you become from go from a distraction to becoming a really useful um, uh, thing that supports the what the users and the exhibitors or whoever you're you know aiming this at uh, is, is is there to do. It's interesting, Mark, that you you mentioned engagement tech as a term, mm. um, and perhaps the word event or the term event tech is too general. I mean. We, the guys here are using top-of-the-range wireless microphones. Is that event tech? We're using it for an event. It is technology. Uh, do we need to start redefining and maybe categorizing certain elements of the devices, of the applications, of the platforms, of anything that we're using to deliver events and start categorizing better than just event tech, which might sound ridiculous given that we're hosting an afternoon called Event Tech Talks. Um, this is something that we actually think quite a lot about at Guidebook as our tool is, is meant to be sort of a, a platform for sometimes subscription-based uh, software. And the mentality in the event industry of we have an event, it has a start date and an end date, so that is when I'm going to be engaging uh, with my audience can be problematic uh, in how they go about deploying that technology and has actually led to some unsuccessful deployments of event apps because they're, they're thinking about it in, in kind of a, a narrow way. Fortunately, we have other, um, a bit more progressive users on our, on our platform that are deploying apps um, in a more sort of holistic way for pre, during, and post event or for even other things, as I mentioned, places um, or venues, things that, that exist uh, year round. Um, but even in our own sort of marketing collateral, and also, um, you know, some people call things 
events or conferences or summits or meetings. Uh, so that term event uh, in the context of event tech or uh, just in the context of um, engagement, it is, it is a bit of a tricky one and I think it is probably a bit too, too you, narrow. You're right because we should never lose sight of the fact that the event industry as a whole is in its very essence subdivided, isn't it, mm. into many, many, many different strands and sectors, some of which share similarities, some of, uh, of which are completely different and perhaps the devices and the stuff that we're using to help deliver those different types of events now needs to start dividing itself out a little bit. Um, let's go back to uh, another question from Glissa that's come in. Um, this is an interesting one. Is, mobile f is the mobile phone, and perhaps the smartphone specifically, the biggest piece of technology that, that, that distracts event goers? Do people now, because they're constantly checking emails and not wanting to be away from their day-to-day -day working lives, constantly want to be fiddling with this device? Um, and is that the biggest distraction that you face? It's not an event-specific development. If you look at the stats for second screen usage during TV or anything that you're doing, I mean, everybody's like looking at their phone all the time, 40% of the time. So um, it's not event-specific. <laughs> it's the biggest distraction ever. Like, I don't think we've had the uh, opportunities that we have now. If you just go into the tube, you'll see 60, 70% of everybody who's on the tube, if you've got reception, looking at their phones. Although there's a famous, uh, or it went a bit viral a while ago, a photo of a, I can't remember if it was a tube or a different train where everyone is, is just completely absorbed in their phones and it's sort of uh, the, the tagline or the meme is this is, you know, the dystopia, the current dystopia that, that we're all living in. Uh, but what actually went viral about that photo was the reaction comment to it, which was a black and white photograph from the 1930s when everyone is sitting on a bus buried in a newspaper. Um, so I think, yes, phones are, are a distraction or they're something that we're, that we're all quite engaged with, but you know, have there always been things that um, have diverted people's attention or are we any more antisocial now that we have uh, this type of technology? I, mean, I don't, that's, that's I don't a, think so. That's a really good point from, a, from an event specific view is what are you doing, that's, what are they being distracted from? So that's what we always have to look at when we're producing an event is, is what are we doing that, that's so easily distracted from? Right. And if, because if people are picking up their phones, then, you know, as, as we all do, is it not compelling enough to put that phone out? I don't need it. Is it not compelling enough for me to actually watch and listen to what's going on? Because that is a critical point. Um, because if they are looking at their phones, then clearly something's, something's going wrong because they're, they're not interested in being there. I don't agree because the phone, again, like when you're looking at your phone when you're watching TV, a lot of the, well, sometimes you're just checking emails, but you know, a lot of companies out there that are trying to create a context to what you're seeing on your phone. Uh, it gives you enhancement. It gives, it gives you personalized if, information if, if, about if, what, what. If it's know. done on purpose, absolutely. If it's done right. with, yeah, absolutely. So, in an event context, you've got the same opportunity. Like, you know, the example that I gave you, who's in the room, it's a pretty interesting question because, you know, there might be some people here you really want to meet, or you've got, you logged on with um, LinkedIn, and you can see that three of your contacts are here that you probably didn't notice when you came in. Mm -hmm. I think that's. Terrific. You know. and, and that point, it's an enhancement, it's not a distraction. But actually, when you're doing a session or some sort of experience which doesn't require mobile technology, then it becomes a distraction. It's, it's not looking at the time frame of the event, isn't yeah. it? You don't want people in your keynote session with Richard Branson up on stage, who's cost hundreds of thousands to get there to present. A lot of money and time and effort's gone into the design of that stage and of the room. There's 2,000 people in there. You don't really want, well, you've got a question whether it's the right thing to ask them all to take out their phones and start using them. If they're tweeting about Richard Branson and posting photos of it, then... Well, well this, this flips us, and you've already mentioned enhancement. You know, we, we've, we've spoken about the distractions and what can be a distraction when we're using event tech. But when we flip it over to the enhancement side of things, we're using uh, the Glissa platform today to put the questions in real time, which is also allowing people to actually put a thumbs up or like those particular questions so we can see when a question is put forward which one is a popular question and which one we think maybe can put to the panel because we know several other people are, are liking that question. So flipping it on its head, we should now start to look at the enhancement side of things and, and what is working well for people, isn't, uh, shouldn't we? I mean, if you're, if you're not, then you're missing a massive opportunity because like we've all said, if you go to an event people are going to be looking at, they are going to see the whites of their screens, maybe even more than the whites of their eyes. And so if you're not addressing that at all, uh, then you're definitely missing a trick, I think. 
And I think as the question came before, it's not just about the event apps, absolutely. You know, we use lots of iPads, tablet technology as well. Um, how you use that, obviously, to enhance the session is really, really important. Um, you know, a big part of, uh, of media technology is actually harmonizing and bringing people together. And those are great techniques, great technology to be able to do that and really changes the session and can really bring um, some really great outcomes out of um, something you're trying to deliver. Um, so there's other technologies that aren't specifically app-based um, but do enhance um, a session. Sure. Um, if, if I could just ask, is it, we'll, we'll do Q&As and stuff with the audience, but um, is, is any, are any of the event organisers who are in the audience today willing to put their hand up and say that they've actually gone a bit too far with how much tech they've put into a particular event? And they've had an example that they've actually, in hindsight, said, we need to rein it in a little bit more. We've just got a bit too carried away. Is anybody willing to stick their hand up and say, yeah, we reined it back a little bit? Oh, interesting. You want to keep putting more and more in. Because somebody did ask on Glisser, are, are organisers guilty of integrating too much into their events? And I think it, it, it constantly goes back to this idea that content is what it starts with. Getting people there and how they're going to engage with the people that you're putting in that event. They've come to an event for a reason. They want to interact face to face, don't they? And whilst the enhancement can come from the other platforms that are out there to aid that, Fundamentally, they should be looking at the content first of all to make sure that that's engaging and using everything else to enhance it. Would I, think, you agree I, think, with that? I think there's certainly a, a realization, um, certainly on the client side, is that they want to use the technology, but the realization of how much work is involved in doing it, and two is creating content. So it's great putting a tablet there and do something with it, but actually the effort to get that content together in time, to produce it, to make it right, to make it really worthwhile in a session is really important. Um, and what I've certainly experienced in the past, what can happen is if they're not in a good place to do that, as you get closed in, those sort of things start to drop off. And that's when the technology becomes less useful because it's not being used to its full ability. This whole distraction or enhancement debate, um, we wanted to keep to the end today because rather than, I think, doing Q&As in a formal way at the end, if at any point during this session somebody's got an opinion, not necessarily a question, but just an opinion, on tech or distract, there we go, hand in the air. Then we'll get the mic to you. Let, let, let's get the debate going on the floor as well. If we've got one of the handheld mics, we're going to get over to this gentleman here because he was very, very eager to become part of this conversation. Once you've got that mic, if you could just tell us who you are and where you are from. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Michael Gentle, flying out of the day, based in Geneva. Uh, Welcome I'm, along. I'm pitching tonight, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, prob more of a comment in terms of, of um, personally having experienced good event tech and also good low tech because I do believe that there's a space for both of them. I attend quite a few trade shows and, and one that comes to mind where, where, where I had really good event tech was I think two or three years ago I attended the, the World Travel Market at, at, at Excel. And uh, my driver for going was attending uh, the many uh, uh, sessions, the conference sessions. That, that was really the thing. So being able to uh, uh, create your own agenda, sign up, register, make sure that you're in, uh, and, and able to actually have that as where am I going to next? I mean, it's massive with Excel. So I mean, that was really an example of very, very useful event tech. So uh, thumbs up to uh, the world travel market. Um, this year, I attended the uh, business travel show and, uh, and Confex and the PA show uh, at Olympia. And it was very low tech. Was, these are two-day events. And it was actually very good because you had the, the uh, um, uh, charts probably about this size strategically placed around the world. You know, okay, what's happening? I can go to this session, go to that session. And the uh, booklets that were handed out at registration was pretty good. You could say, okay, where, can, where shall I go to now? You know, at a glance, you can look at it. So, at those shows uh, um, this year, low tech was actually very good, and I don't think an event app would have added any value. In fact, I think it would have been much worse. Was that in hindsight, or did that strike you immediately? Do, do your expectations of what level of technology you expect to see integrated into an event, do, does it change with the type of event that you know that you're going to? Is it predetermined? I don't really know. It's just that at all three events that I just mentioned, there was nothing that kicked in and said, this could have been done differently. So it was actually, it was the right technology or low tech for the type of event. So I don't know, just want to comment on that, but I guess my key thing, and I'll stop there, is that there is a place for low tech, and sometimes you don't need an event app. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's interesting. Perhaps we could come to, to, to Katie and to, and to Richard Kalis here from an event app point of view. Working with clients, uh, are there examples where you've actually used it on a minimal level because that's what's been right for the particular customer. I know, Richard, you said that you work on a, perhaps a, a slightly different level, but 
Katie, guidebook, keep it minimal? Absolutely, and I was um, gonna say this earlier when we were talking about um, you know, kind of the line between or when, when should you simplify versus kind of try to go more, more technical. Um, I think there are many events that, that do not um, benefit from having event apps, and there are many events that benefit from having very simple, uh, very simple apps. And one of the, one of the good things about having a, a platform like Guidebook, uh, like Richard mentioned, that you can sort of like drag and drop and pick the things that, that you need and you don't need, is that you do have the flexibility to, to create something that is just very simple, and we have like a, a free version where you just put on, you know, a schedule and a map and a few photos. And sometimes that really is that really is all you need. Um, I know we have a few startup um, folks in in the audience. Uh, Peter Thiel wrote a book called Zero to One about successful startups, um, which says that only successful startups that provide a 10x improvement on an existing solution um, will really be successful. Um, and I think that that's true with tech, with tech, and in this case, event tech specifically as well. Unless there's a solution that's actually 10 times better than what you're than what you currently have, um, it's it probably it won't won't get very far. So if you do have a massive expo, and instead of your delegates, you know, flipping through a, a huge booklet or, or trying to sort their way out on a map or exchanging paper business cards, you can replace that with a digital solution. Absolutely, that's that's 10 times better than than what they're currently doing. So I think mm. that could be a good sort of framework for, for people to look at on, on when and, and when not um, this type of tech is, is appropriate. I think, appropriate. No, it's, I think it's a bit more complex in my mind anyways because there's there's the functionality aspect, like what, what can we offer, and then there's a the commercial aspect. And um, you know we've been talking a lot about content, but there's obviously some other things that are very, very important that you can do with an app that you can't do or you couldn't do otherwise, which is uh, routing. And we've heard this example, right? Uh, you've got a meeting and you need to get to the next um, to the next conference room or the next um, lecture theater, and you don't know where you're going, so an app can really help you. If you're in a big uh, trade show, you need to find a few exhibitors, and it's across multiple halls. Being able to find the next place to go to is, is, is quite an important use case, and I think that is a 10x uh, thing because it was never possible before, and you're used to having it from your car and from, you know, from everywhere. So um, right now, the technical opportunities that there are to get really good indoor routing, um, at least what we've seen, and we've been trying this for a couple of years now, they're really expensive. <laughs> so you need a lot of users using the app, or you need to have a very high value event to make it worthwhile. That's what I meant by there's a commercial angle to this as well at the moment. Good things sometimes cost quite a lot of money, so some events can actually afford it, and they want to afford it, like we did um, HP Discover, you know, HP's mm -hmm. um, uh, flagship conference in Las Vegas, and they, they actually bought an indoor routing company and merged it with a beacon company and obviously, they were trying to showcase this technology because they think this is where it's going, um, and it was, you know, that's super useful. But uh, again, it does. Th there's a commercial angle to some of the technology. I agree. Some some things are really cheap and easy to do, but um, to make it extremely intuitive and seamless, mm -hmm. so that it kind of blends in the background and you don't even like, you know, if two taps. There's somebody behind you who you should meet. I've never seen anybody doing that properly. You know, what, you know a lot of people have iWatches now, 10 million. I heard so. You know, why aren't we getting this? because it's really hard to do and complicated and, and it takes a lot of infrastructure in place that it kind of blends in the background, but it's, mm. you know, it's, not, it's not like turnkey yet. I think, I think the other argument on the other side of that, Richard, is, is how much do we do for a delegate as well? Uh, and I'm all for technology making life easier, but I do wonder if you do so much for somebody where they don't even have to think about anything at all. When we talk about distraction, so no longer am I as engaged because it's all done for me. And almost do I even need to be there because there's so much done for me that I, I don't need to do. I don't need to think about anything. So do we lose levels of engagement where it's just it's so so convenient where I, I don't have to worry about anything and it's I don't think about it. Reminds me of people not finding their way anymore because they're so used to using their phone as a <laughs> GPS so that they kind of yep. are lost whenever they have to orient themselves. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's where it's going, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. yeah. It, it appears that people on Glissa certainly share your, your thoughts you said earlier about people watching TV, for example, and using their phones at the same time. Because so, somebody to put on Glissa, surely if people are already distracted, i.e. emails, texts, other messaging, why not own it with your own content? If, they, if you know they're going to be checking their devices anyway, that's the point where you own the content and you own the fact that they are going to be using them. Again, it's hard. Like um, one of the partners that we work with, Urban Airship, um, Scott Townsend, had a really, really amazing quote that I love to put out there. It's like, mobile is all about better never than late. So getting it 
getting the right message to the people and getting their attention at the right moment with the right kind of relevant content is really hard. So um, yeah, I think we're still working at that. And I think if you can't get it right, it immediately becomes a distraction, right? So you know, meeting the right person mm -hmm. in, your, in that particular moment and you're getting introduced and you know, we, should, we should have a chat. Yeah. Um, it's great. Five minutes later, everybody's moved on. What the hell is this, right? It's totally useless. So it just becomes an annoyance, and you do it twice, and then you're like, ah, oh, this, this app sucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I kind of disagree. I think for the level of some of the things that you're talking about, like, um, like iBeacons or routing or, or some of this very advanced, you know, completely seamless integration of, um, yeah, very, very high-tech at events, sure, that it's very expensive and it's very difficult, and it's, at, you know, one maybe point zero one percent of people are, are doing it properly and, and successfully now for these very high end uh, level events. But I think for the average kind of conference event organizer that has a three day uh, event with a keynote speaker and some schedule tracks and a map and want to integrate social media and just want to be engaging with their audience that again are already using their devices at the event. I actually think that that's relatively simple and especially where we are today with um, the number of apps that, that have um, existed. And, and as I think you mentioned earlier, Richard, kind of the learnings that um, you can have on an, on an iterative basis if you have multiple events or um, if you've seen or been to other events that, that have deployed this, this type of technology, then taking what you know kind of already, already works um, and, and getting something off the ground is, is actually, I mean, you can build a guide on Guidebook. We do, we do workshops. You can do it in seven minutes. Um, so just for doing something that is quite simple, um, I, I actually think that that's, that that's quite easy. And the, the amount of um, enhancement that you can get from that um, is, is pretty easy to, to see. It's tough to get the 10x, though, on those. We, we, we've done a, a series of events for one of our customers. And we, we started off with a very simple app, like the you know, schedule and stuff. And it was, it was a two-day event. Um, I had 30 sessions, two rooms, and nobody was using the app because you didn't need routing, you didn't need to know the, to plan your schedule. Uh, you know, it, there's a level where it, mm -hmm. th th it's so simple that it, the technology doesn't give you that added benefit, really. So then you have to think about, okay, so yeah. what, do we, you know, what do we need to put in there to make it more engaging? What's really, what's, you know, and, and then we're talking about some of the stuff's advanced and some of it's not so advanced, but you, know, you really need to think wh where, we, where are we really providing a benefit? It does uh, depend on the event. I sure. believe we've got a question at the back of the room. Yes. Uh, surprise, surprise. Um, I think the first thing is I bet all of these panelists would agree with me that the very starting point for any kind of event tech um, is to think about what your objectives are and what your KPIs are, uh, KPIs are and what your customer journey is and how that will properly be utilised in amongst those things. And it was me who said, why are we just talking about event apps? And I love event apps, don't get me wrong. I'm a big evangelist about them. Um, but I want to dispel the myth that all of these other event technologies are actually necessarily really, really costly and overcomplicated. Um, because I think you can do a lot of things with a lot of tech creatively. And it is all around engaging your audience better, providing a better experience. Obviously, there's also the data aspect of it that anything from event apps to registration tools to even experiential photo marketing, RFID activations, you know, can provide you with data and insight. I think what you then do with that, you know, a lot of people get data and then don't do, it, do anything with it. And I think it's a responsibility for anyone who is a, a, an event tech provider to try to um, provide data back in a way that then makes sense against those initial KPIs and objectives because people say they want to capture it and then they capture it and then they're on to the next thing. We're all vis busy, busy event professionals and we don't know what we're doing with that data. So I think those are all of the kind of basic things that you should take into account in the first place before you even think about um, implementing We should tech. also point out that today, a lot of the session, when we talk about enhancement or distraction, we very much looked at it from a, a delegate and a, and a visitor point of view, haven't we? But 
we, we haven't really touched on whether or not it's an enhancement or a distraction to the organiser themselves and what some of this data that comes back in from using some of this tech can do to enhance the organisational aspects of staging an event. And perhaps, mm -hmm. I don't know whether, uh, Mark, uh, yeah, operationally, so. has, has some of the event tech that's now available to you guys helped you and enhanced the ability to actually plan these? Mm. I think certainly social media is probably the key amongst those. Um, during Cisco Live, we have a team of people that are, are sit there, sat there monitoring all of the incoming social media interactions. There's something like over 20,000 of them during the show. And each one, each interaction is categorized and, and classed between um, is, it, is, it a, is it a negative, is it neutral, is it positive, is it, about a, is it an operational, is it a complaint about cues to the toilets, is it my room's too hot, is it that the speaker's too boring, and, and all of these uh, comments and thoughts from the delegates are, are taken in, categorised. You mentioned KPIs, they're actually used as a KPI as well. Um, they, we're set for the operational tweets, 98% mm -hmm. either neutral or positive to the tweets or, or to the social media impressions. Um, and, and that team are also responding. So if someone's tweeted that their room's too hot, they'll get a reply back saying, OK, we've lowered the temperature. It's going to take about 30 minutes to take effect. Thanks for letting us know. That delegate suddenly feels like they're part of something Absolutely. that, that Top they've of the world. been actioned. And, and that, uh, that experience has gone from a negative to a very positive. We've seen examples of that, haven't we, in day-to-day -day life with, with, with major retailers really sort of taking advantage of social media, haven't we, to engage with people who may have mm -hmm. a bit of an issue with something and dealing with it very, very well. And, and I, I don't know whether or not there are further examples of that and whether anybody in the room has got examples of where they've actually in real time used something like social media to respond to criticism during an event and actually adapted it. Um, what we do have is time for perhaps one more question from the floor. If anybody else does have a final question, if anybody wants to put their hand in the air and, and offer an opinion or a comment, on distraction or enhancement. Gentleman at the back, yes. Just your name and uh, company, please. Hi, Chris from Doosra. Uh, just wondering, we've only spoken about mobile apps up to now. Um, just wondering what the panel's thoughts are on providing delegates with a device. Possibly it's been put in guided access mode to maybe take away the distraction element that you could have using your mobile phone. So actually giving yeah. the, the, de the delegates Physical the device. hardware them itself. Um, I've been to a few events where they distribute uh, tablets, and a few of our clients are, are still doing that. Uh, what you end up having is just people walking around with two things. Uh, they have their personal one, and then they, they have their tablets. I don't know if anyone else has, has seen that or, or agrees with me, but that's uh, just anecdotally what we have seen, and, and typically why we hear people going towards the more BYOD model, because it's mm -hmm. cheaper and um, less excessive. Yeah, it doesn't scale. You can do that to maybe 500 people, 300 people. If you've got a bigger event, it's tough to get those to get that hardware, and it's really expensive. You have to worry about the charging, the re reverse logistics, getting all the stuff back, things breaking, exchanging it. It's a massive overhead. If you the, the challenge, if it, if you're doing it on the mobile phone, it's everybody has it. Like you said, bring your own device, right? You you have it in your pocket already. The challenge there is getting it so simple that it's almost at the same level as a, as a dedicated device. So taking those distractions away, and you know, like my example there usually is, you know, what I said earlier. When you're in the room, you want to know who else is here. You pops up a push message on the lock screen. You swipe it, and you're right there in the room, and you see who else is there. And it's ordered in a way that shows you the people that you know at the top of the list. That's the kind of thing that, you know, we. That's what I want more of. And and we're still, I mean, we're 10 percent there. It's crazy. Like we've got so much ahead of us. It's great, but at the same time, it's a bit frustrating. <laughs> and I think it sort of depends on the event and the audience as well. Because in some cases, um, you know, expect people to bring their own device. That's fine. But for some corporates and companies that actually may have people that don't have devices or have mixed devices, and actually there's still a, a few people that don't have smart devices in this country, so that they still have to provide them. And that's quite often where we do tablet tech and we do things obviously in tables and, and various different places. Do you think there's a, an additional benefit to the organisers, though, just to come back to your point earlier, um, in terms of being able to almost guarantee engagement? If you are providing somebody with a device, perhaps you can push content directly to it, um, versus using a mobile device where you can choose or choose not to, or like you said, you might not have the correct device at all. I think generally, um, like the, the, I'll call it the carrot method of engagement works better than the stick method. Um, so sort of meeting people where they're at and giving them a reason to want to engage, uh, to want, if, whether it's with the app or any other sort of content that, that you're putting at, at your event, you can sort of um, 
paternalistically put them, you know, hold their hands throughout the entire event and, and make sure that they're doing every single every single thing. But, you know, at any point, someone could just nod off in the middle of your session and, and fall asleep. So I think creating uh, an environment um, that's leading people to be engaged and, and again, taking advantage of the tools that, that they're already already using and, and, and meeting them where they are, um, generally more, more successful and also just less stressful. Could I step away from being devil's advocate for a second and offer an, my own opinion on this? I think that if you're having to force something on people to engage them, then fundamentally you're doing something wrong at the start of the whole process with the content that you're putting together and the engagement that you're looking to generate. It's also in control environment. So you have a much better handle on what the experience feels like from the attendee perspective. That's the advantage of having a dedicated device. I'm not, I, I think it's great to have dedicated, I just don't think it scales. I don't think the commercials behind it really work. On some events they do. I agree with you, uh, Richard, that um, th I think a good way is to kind of have, augment the device population with those like devices that you know work, like an iPod Touch or a, you know, a tablet or whatever it is, for the people who don't have a smartphone or don't want to use their smartphone and so on. Um, but you know, have, have most of the people use their own smartphone because most of the time it works. Guys, we're going to start wrapping up. Um, in an ideal, what, uh, ideal world, what I do now is say to everybody, turn off your phones, let's all go down the pub, and let's just chat about what we've had uh, discussed today over five or six pints. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. So what I would instead like to invite everybody to do is once this session is finished, do hang around, do grab the guys, any of the guys who've been speaking uh, on today's panel sessions, um, and ask them questions. Get face to face with them, share some contact details, Ask them anything that you may have not wanted to stick your hand up and shout down a microphone. Um, no question is too stupid. I've proved that doing many episodes of the Talking Events podcast. We're going to wrap up the sessions this afternoon. We're going to wrap up our first ever Event Tech Talks. Um, and we've got a few thank yous to run through and a few mentions to give out. First of all, for those of you interested in finding out a little bit more about Event Tech, we should point out Event Tech Live is returning to the old Truman Brewery um, in Shoreditch on the 9th of November. It's Europe's only dedicated Event Tech event. Uh, get yourself along there. It will be in its fourth year, I think, this year. Um, that's on the 9th of November. I know that Adam Parry, one of the organisers of Event Tech Live, joins us today. Adam's at the back of the room. Um, go and speak to Adam if you're interested in, uh, in getting involved with Event Tech Live. We should also thank our, our sponsors and the people who have helped facilitate and put together today. Um, we've got Boomset, um, Glissa, who've been fantastic in supplying us with this our very own engagement tool to get some of the questions to the panel today. Um, GES, our headline sponsor, First Sight Media, who facilitated the live streams this afternoon, um, and KPMG. There's some guys here from Huckletree as well, from the facility itself, who help incubate and support tech startups. So if anybody here this afternoon wants to speak to one of the guys from Huckletree or KPMG about the support that they can give, then grab one of those as well. I think we're just about at the end of things. Let's thank our final panel of this afternoon. Um, we've got Richard Hingley, DRP Group. Richard, thank you very much for your input. <laughs> Katie Williams from Guidebook. Richard Kalius, Event Base. Thanks for joining us, Richard. And Mark Bannister from George P. Johnson. All of the sessions this afternoon have been designed to dovetail very nicely with each other. You'll notice there's been a lot of crossover between the three sessions. All three of them are going to be put up onto the eventindustrynews.co.uk website, so you'll be able to access them after today to watch them back, to listen to them, to look at anything, and keep the hashtags going. If you've got any questions, you want to use those hashtags, then please do engage with them. This has been the first Event Tech Talks. We hope to be back next year. Thanks for joining us. Let's finish it off there. <laughs>